Well, if you're over the age of 18, then probably the years seem to tick by like second hand, the second hand on a watch. Of course, you'd probably have to be over 40 to know what a second hand on a watch is. It's a new year, but the old challenges have not left us. It, uh, it is good to have a new resolve to face both the challenges and the opportunities that we are faced with in 2023. The best way to take on the increasingly chaotic world in which we live is with an understanding of the world from the creator of the world, God. And the way we do that is through his word, the Bible. Now, this is called a biblical worldview, looking at the world around us through the words of the one who created it and gave us the roadmap to navigate it. But how many Christians actually look at the world this way? How can we obtain a biblical worldview and how can we teach this to our children so that they can see the world this way? Well, joining me now to discuss this in more is Dr. George Barna, Senior Research Fellow for the Center for Biblical Worldview at the Family Research Council. George, welcome back to Washington Watch. Tony, always good to be with you. And Happy New Year. Same to you, my friend. Now, you've spent a lifetime studying how people think and behave, and you've said we're, we're faced with a crisis. And that crisis that we're facing, it's not, it's not the debt, although that's a problem. It, it's not the global instability, although that's a problem. It, it, it's not even the, the social and moral crisis that we're faced with through the policies advanced by government, although those are problematic. You really go to the heart of the matter. What is this crisis that you talk about? Well, Tony, all the issues that you've alluded to exist as problems for us and everyone else because of the prevailing worldview of Americans. A worldview is what causes you to make your decisions. It helps you to make sense of the world, helps you to figure out who you are, what kind of person you want to be, what kind of life you want to live, how you're going to do that. And so when you look at all those issues, it's a result of the cumulative worldviews of Americans and the decisions that emanate from that. So if we want to pull our country back together, we want to be a stable, solid, reliable, trustworthy group of people, it all comes back to worldview. And the problem that we've got is that currently so few people, less than one out of every 20 Americans has a biblical worldview. And until we get back to the point where we recognize there's only one source of truth, and that's God, and that God has communicated that truth to us in one book, the Bible, and he gave that to us so that we can thrive in life, which is his greatest desire for us. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to make good, right, proper, appropriate decisions. And so he gave us the guidebook for that. But until we're willing to go back and recognize him and his words as being the thing that we need to guide us, we're still going to continue with those other problems. So, George, a, a worldview is the framework by which we evaluate the world around us. We, 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 it's the lenses through which, if you think, like glasses, that we look through and we see the world around us. So how do you get that? I mean, is that something you can order from Amazon? I mean, how do you get the, a worldview? I wish it were that easy, and, and finally I'd be able to uh, support Amazon, but uh, no, unfortunately it's much more difficult than that. We know that a person's worldview begins developing at 15 to 18 months of age and is pretty much formed in full and for the rest of their life by the age of 13. And so how does that develop during those early years? It develops by direct teaching, us telling children what to think, what to believe, how to interpret different aspects of reality. It develops by us modeling the principles of a biblical worldview, those principles that are in God's Word. It develops by the reinforcement that we give to our children when they do things that are consistent with the way that God has called us to live. And so that's all very important, but it's very intentional. Right. A worldview doesn't happen by accident. It's very intentional. I mean, that sounds like uh, what uh, the Lord told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy, that you're to talk about these things with your children when you sit down, when you rise up, when you walk in the way. I mean, the parents should be talking about the things of God to their children, and including the Word of God, to help them understand how that integrates with the world around them. Is that what Scripture says? 
very much. I mean, if you go back to that passage in Deuteronomy 6, where it talks about how to be a parent, that children are a gift from God, but we have a responsibility to raise them in a particular way. Most Americans I know from the research I've done do not believe that children are necessarily a gift from God, and most of them uh, certainly do not believe that the way they raise their children is the single most important thing they'll do in their life. And so when you read that particular portion of Scripture and other passages in, in Proverbs and elsewhere, it talks about this has to always be on your mind. Everything that you do should be done with the idea of demonstrating to your children and, and describing to your children how to live a godly, righteous, appropriate life. And it's imperative that you do this every day from morning till night and that you encourage them to become Christ-like. That's what good parenting ultimately is. That's the intentionality you're talking about. You have to be diligent, intentional. It doesn't just happen. You have to be focused on this. So let's let's talk about the, the, the worldviews that are out there. I mean, what are the competing worldviews? What do we see in America today when it comes to worldview? There are seven or eight different major philosophies of life that are taught at universities and even in some high schools and elsewhere. Certainly you're exposed to them through entertainment and arts all the time. There are things like postmodernism, secular humanism, Marxism, uh, Eastern mysticism, and so on. People have heard all these names. They don't know very much about the content of those philosophies of life. So what happens is very insidiously, we become exposed to ideas from those different philosophies and what I've discovered is that most people, if it feels good to them, they embrace it without thinking about the long-term or deeper implications of embracing those particular principles. And frankly, what we discovered is that by far the most common worldview in America today is what we call syncretism, where almost nine out of 10 Americans have that as their dominant worldview. And all that is, is simply taking different elements from many different worldviews, piecing them together into a customized, personalized worldview that makes us feel good about ourselves and our world and our future. And it may have nothing to do with God. It may have nothing to do with truth. More than anything else, it's an emotional reaction to what is going to make us feel good and feel right. I mean, that sounds like, uh, again, referring to the Old Testament, where every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, there was exactly it. Yeah, they just and, and we're just kind of freestyling. We're we're, we're collect and, and there was a lot of syncretic uh, syncretism when it came to the worship of the Old Testament, where they blended the idols of the uh, of, of Canaan with the worship of the true God. That's what led them astray. Let's go back very quickly before we run out of time, because I want to get to the to the heart of the matter. You made reference to when a worldview begins. It starts as a child between, you know, 13, 15 months to 13 years. And, and I think I've, we've discussed this before. Your research shows that most people, when they die, have the same worldview that they had when they were 13 years old. Uh, very little change takes place. So that, that first 13 years seems to be very critical. Could that be why there is such a battle to have early childhood education and for, you know, government schools to get our children at earlier and earlier ages? I think that's exactly why. I mean, I, I'm not the only uh, researcher who's identified the fact that that worldview gets developed very young. May have been one of the first, but now a lot of organizations are piling onto that and realizing, okay, so winning over the children is very important. And of course, that's always been one of Satan's strategies. Uh, but if you look at world leaders, totalitarian leaders in particular, many of them have made statements like, if you give me a child till he's seven, or if you give me a child till he's nine, I'll have him for the rest of their life. And that's exactly what's happening now in America, is that many organizations, many individuals, many factions are realizing that if we want to maintain power and authority for a long period of time, if we train the children to think the way we want them to think when they're young, we're not going to have to fight a battle with the parents later on because we'll already have won them over. Well, we're, we're actually seeing that unfold. This goes to the 
importance of parents and pastors, uh, Sunday school teachers, realizing those formative years beginning in the nursery uh, all the way up uh, through elementary school and into junior high. Uh, George, we're out of time, uh, but I want to thank you again for joining us and appreciate the work you do in our Center for Biblical Worldview. And we're going to be coming out with some resources this year to help parents and help pastors develop that worldview in the young people in their churches. So, George, great to see you. And uh, again, have a, a wonderful new year. Thanks, Tony. Same to you.